In a relay race, it's not always the fastest runners that win. Uh, the winning team is the one who can get the baton around the track and the shortest amount of time, but of course the baton can't hit the ground. If it does hit the ground, then by all accounts, the, 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 the race is lost. There's no way that you can really recover from that. And that's why if you're ever around a track team, the relay runners, all they do is practice the handoff over and over and over because passing the baton is harder than it looks. Even if you're a world-class athlete, passing the baton is hard. Well, maybe you see where this is going, but, but let's pull it all the way through. We as a church, we as Christians, we as a, a family, we've got a baton that we've got to pass. But the baton we have is a lot more important, a lot more precious than a six-inch metal tube. It is our relationship with God. It is our allegiance to King Jesus. It's our faith in the only good and wise King. So, so here's what we have to understand. God has given us a faith that we are supposed to pass. Parents pass to kids. But more than that, a, a church has to pass on the faith to the next generation. That's what God says. Look at the book of Judges and what God says here. It says, after that, a whole generation had been gathered to their ancestors. In other words, they had died. Another generation grew up who knew neither the Lord nor what he had done for Israel. So you catch what's happening. A generation has died, and they didn't pass the baton of faith to the next generation. So they grew up not knowing the Lord. Now, that doesn't mean they didn't know the name. That doesn't mean they couldn't have passed a test. It means they didn't know him in kind of an experiential way. Because the longest distance in the world is the six inches between a person's head and their heart. Now, now who dropped the baton of faith? Who, where, where, where does responsibility lie? Well, it looks from this verse like it lies with those that were older. It lies with the adults that parents had this responsibility to pass the baton of faith to their kids but, but catch this, all of us, no matter our stage of life, no matter our age, no matter, no matter our demographic, all of us have this responsibility to pass the baton of faith to the next generation. Because here's a really important truth. The church is only one generation from extinction. I don't say that to alarm you, but I do say it to sober you. I think it's sobering to think that the church is only one generation for extinction. But, but it's not new. In other words, every generation of the church, every generation of Christians have had this responsibility to pass that baton of faith. Now, if you've been following us with us through the book of Genesis, then if we're just going to keep this metaphor going, Abraham and Sarah have died and passed the baton to their son Isaac. Now Isaac, he lives a long life, but there's not a lot written about him in the book of Genesis. We'll look at him this week and next week, and, and, and you can kind of think of it this way. When Moses surveyed Isaac's long life, he picked a couple stories, a couple of really important stories to teach us vital truths. So we're going to dive into the chapter, and then we're going to come back and say, okay, how does uh, this teach us about passing the baton of faith to the next generation? It's Genesis chapter 26, verse 1. Now there was a famine in the land, besides the previous famine in Abraham's time. And Isaac went to Abimelech, king of the Philistines in Gerar. Now as you read this, you can't help but think this is like Groundhog Day. You know, that, that movie that just the same thing happens over and over and over. Or as the talking heads used to sing, same as it ever was. Because remember, there was a famine in Abraham's day. In fact, the author wants to tell you that this story in Isaac's life is connected to the story in Abraham's life. It well, doesn't take a great memory to remember. A few chapters ago, Abraham faced similar circumstances. And when the hardship of a famine came into his life, he didn't trust God to provide. 
Instead, he refused to trust God and sinfully went down into Egypt, where he tried to take control of his own life and make his own plan. He thought he would be better off in charge than uh, God was. And when he got to Egypt, he lied about his wife, Sarah, saying that she was his sister, not his wife, all because he was scared of what would happen to him. So as we read this opening verse of Genesis 26, we're all wondering, what is Isaac going to do in similar circumstances? Well, first, God intervenes in verse 2. The Lord appeared to Isaac and said, do not go down to Egypt. Live in the land where I tell you to live. So God can see how this is all unfolding, and he can tell that Isaac is headed down the same path that his father Abraham had gone down. So he says, look, don't do this. Don't go down that same path. Don't go to Egypt. Trust me. So does God's warning work in Isaac's life? Mm, Not so much. Uh, Verse 7. When the men of that place asked him about his wife, he said, she is my sister, because he was afraid to say she is my wife. He thought the men of this place might kill me on account of Rebekah because she's beautiful. So Isaac does the exact same things. He commits the exact same sins of his father Abraham. When there's a famine, he doesn't trust God. He he resists God's will and heads to a foreign country. He lies about his wife to protect his own skin. Here's how it plays out. Verse 8. When Isaac had been there a long time, Abimelech, king of the Philistines, looked down from a window and saw Isaac caressing his wife, Rebekah. I mean, Abimelech's thinking, what what redneck family is this that this guy's hitting on his sister? But really, the truth is, Abimelech's smarter. He's figured out Isaac's lie. Abimelech summoned Isaac and said, she is really your wife. Why did you say she's my sister? Isaac answered him, because I thought I might lose my life on account of her. See, this story has something to say to all of us. One thing it says to parents is that you have been invested by God with a powerful influence in your kid's life. And that influence can be used for good or for ill. And of course it says to children, not not just young children, but all of us who are children. Learn. Learn from your parents' successes and their failures. Learn from their example, the good and the bad. Learn from where they followed Jesus and where they didn't follow Jesus. See, Isaiah, uh, or Isaac in Genesis 26 is being addressed to all of us. And, and, and before we get to what it says to our whole church community, I, I want to just take a second to speak directly to parents. And I want to say again that God has invested you with a powerful influence in your child's life. It very well might be that your relationship with your child is the most powerful relationship that your child will ever experience. But where does that power come from? What's it rooted in? It might surprise you to find out that it is not rooted in you being a perfect parent. You don't get power, the power of influence in your child's life by being a perfect parent. And the power of that influence does not call you to be a perfect parent. I think that can just be a relief because sometimes we read these books, well-meaning books, sometimes well-meaning Christian books, and they just put us under the pile of all these things you're supposed to do and be, and you just go, I can't measure up to that. But the truth is that the pressure doesn't just come from the outside. It comes from the inside. It comes from ourselves. You ever ask yourself, why is it we put so much pressure on ourselves to be a perfect parent? That could be like a whole conversation, couldn't it? Of, Of why we pressure ourselves to be something we can't be. And maybe you say, well, I, I try to be a perfect parent because I love my kid. And there's no doubt that is true. I believe that you love your child. I believe that every parent loves their child. Nobody leaves the hospital thinking, how can I screw up this kid's life? And and yet I wonder, I wonder if some of that pressure we put on ourselves is more about us and less about them. Maybe it'll comfort you like it does me to know that the Bible does not record any perfect parents. There aren't any. I mean, I've looked. Not Adam, not Eve, not Noah, not David, not Samuel, not Eli. There are no perfect parents. 
And so that expectation to be something that you can't be doesn't come from God. And you go, well, what about Joseph and Mary? They did a pretty good job with Jesus. And I go, yeah, they had an advantage that you and I didn't have. They had a sinless kid. I don't have any sinless kids. Do you have any? I didn't think so. So what we're supposed to take away from this is that parenting is more difficult than probably we expected it to be. It's hard, and it's okay to admit that. One of the reasons that parenting is so hard is because parenting exposes the idols of the parents. Did you catch that? Parenting exposes the idols of the parent. Let's say you're a person that has control issues. You know, you, you like to have a plan. You like to kind of be in charge. You, you like to know what's going to happen. You like to, 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 well, be in control. Well, now all of a sudden you've had this child, and that child gets a vote. And guess what? No matter if it's young or older, you don't control that child. Maybe your issue is comfort. I mean, all of us like comfort, but maybe for you, the, the measure of a good life is a comfortable, hassle-free life. If that's the case, then your kids' needs are always going to be seen as an interruption. An interruption is something that you really want, a big inconvenience and hassle. Let's say that, that your idol is that you want to be respected and thanked and appreciated. Well, good luck with that. I don't know any kid, no matter really how old they are, that walks around and says, hey, mom and dad, I've just really noticed how you've been making a lot of sacrifices for the family. Cooking and cleaning up dinner, going to the grocery store, changing my bed sheets, mowing the lawn. I, I, I just want to say thank you so much for all your sacrifices. I really appreciate a well-stocked pantry. Nobody says that, right? No kid does. And the reality is that you didn't say that when you were a kid. Most of us don't appreciate how much our parents sacrifice for us until we become parents ourselves. What about freedom? Maybe you're the kind of person that likes to have your freedom, do what you want, when you want, spend your money how you want. And then you have a kid. And you realize that you're a parent 24-7, 365, no off hours, no vacations, no breaks. You're always a parent. And in one sense, that's fantastic because being a parent is a blast. It, it, it's part of God's calling and mission. It's super fulfilling. In another sense, though, in real life, it can also be exhausting and overwhelming. So parenting exposes our idols. It all starts all the way back with Adam and Eve. And they have this kind of what turns into a dysfunctional relationship where they're blaming each other. They got two boys, Cain and Abel. Uh, Cain kills Abel, and it's all downhill from there. And yet, as difficult as parenting is, whether you're uh, a, a, a single parent, whether you have a mom and dad at a home, a blended family, parenting is, is incredibly hard. Here's the reality, though. That, that God sent that child home with you. Like when you had the baby in the hospital, God sent the child home with you. I remember when Christine and I, uh, 25 years ago, had our first child. It was literally like kids having kids. We, I don't know how we survived it, but somehow, like everyone else, we did. And I remember when we walked home with our first child, we were leaving that hospital walking out, and I expected alarms to go off, right? Like they weren't really going to let me take this kid home, were they? I mean, maybe they should keep him at the hospital and I could come visit him every day. Maybe I had to take a test because I, I, I wasn't sure I knew what I was doing. Why did they have confidence that we knew what we were doing? Parenting is messy. It's difficult. It's hard. And sometimes I think what we need to do is just simplify it. Maybe we've made parenting too complicated. All right, so let's simplify it. When my grandma uh, used to take me around when I was young, we used to go to all these little diner restaurants. We'd travel all over the country. And the ones that had the paper placemats always had games on the back. And one of the games that I liked to see was the maze. So here is one of those games you might find. And there's Peter Pan, and he's trying to reach Wendy. And, and so I'd always start there with Peter Pan and trying to get down to, to Wendy. And I'd get frustrated and ask my grandma for help until she finally told me the way she cheated the system. And that is that she said, start with the end and then work backward to the beginning. 
Because if you start at the beginning, there's a lot of ways that seem good but end in a dead end. But if you start at the end and work back to the beginning, well, there's only one path that works. So what if we did that? What if we figured out what's the end of parenting? Like what's our main goal? What's our priority? What is it we really want to make sure we hit a home run in? Here's a way of, of, of saying it or asking it. What are you willing to say no to so you can say yes to the most important thing? Because the reality is there's a lot of really good things out there that you could want for your kid. And, and you've got to say no to some of them because you can't do everything. So what are you going to say no to so you can say yes to the most important, the best thing? Well, I'm afraid that what happens is that what we say yes to in our mind is this perfect family. And it all, we all have different visions of what the perfect family looks like. I just Googled perfect family image. And this is what came up. These people, they look like the perfect family, don't they? In some sense, I mean, at least somebody's vi vision of the perfect family. They're dressed nice. They, they, they're attractive people. And there they are in their great pose. But the reality is this is a stock photo. I don't even know if these people know each other. They could be actors that just walked onto a set and did what the photographer told them. So we're all trying to have this perfect family, but I'm not sure a perfect family even really exists. You know, here's reality. <laughs> reality is this photo. Reality is mom and dad trying to have this beautiful family photo, and here's Junior up chucking in the middle of it. Mom and dad are oblivious while he's vomiting out of nose and mouth. People are shooting for the perfect family, but the reality is this is what our families are mostly like. So if we're not going to shoot for a perfect family, what is it we're supposed to shoot for? Well, I think you know what I'd say. Here we are in church. What I'd say, what the Bible says, what God says is the, the right end, the right priority we should be aiming for. But what if I looked at your calendar? And not, mean, not meaning during the virus, but, but what if I looked at your calendar for 2019 and I just went through it, what would I think your priorities were for your kid? Or your bank statement? What do you spend money on? What, 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 what if I asked your kids? Yeah, that's scary, isn't it? What if I just went and asked your kids, what do mom and dad get most excited about? What do they talk a lot about? What do they get most upset by? What, what, what are they uh, uh, reward in your life? What is that? See, I, I bet your kids would say some things like this, because I've asked my kids, and it, it's somewhat revealing and almost embarrassing question to ask. But they might say, clean room, uh, make my bed, get good grades, try my hardest, good manners, or wait for it, do well in sports. That's what they seem to get most excited about. That's where we seem to spend most of our time and our money and our energy. Is that what you want to be the main thing? See, Jesus put it all in perspective when he said in Mark 8, 36, what good is it for someone to gain the whole world yet forfeit their soul? What good is it for someone to be a straight-A student? What good is it for someone to be the best athlete, to get into Harvard, to have the best manners, to always give their best, and forfeit their soul. See, it's not that those are bad things. They're great things that can be brought into a relationship with Christ and lived oh, the lordship of Christ over all those areas of life. But when they become the main thing, when they become what we spend our time and our money, what we get excited about, what we reward, what we get upset about, then somehow we've put the main thing uh, as something other than Jesus. But is it really what we know is right and what we genuinely want is to be able to say, whether it's our daughters or our sons, to say that what we really want for them is them to love Jesus, to have a lifetime relationship with Jesus, to follow Jesus, to, to love God and love others, however you want to say it in your life. Isn't that what we really want? But then, of course, that brings us to this question. Who has the primary responsibility to teach my kids to follow Jesus. Who has the primary responsibility to teach my kids to follow Jesus? The answer is easy. Church, right? Uh, no. No, I mean, I know how you get there, but no. 
You get there because what do we all do? All parents do this. If you want your kid to do well in math, what do you do? Well, you hire a math tutor. How about if you want them to learn an instrument? Well, you sign them up for, say, piano lessons with their piano teacher. Or if you want them to be involved in sports or dance or some activities, it's not that you teach them yourself. Instead, what you do is you put them on a team and the coach does it. So now it comes to faith. I want my kids to learn about Christianity, to learn about God, to learn about Jesus. So what do I do? Well, I take them to the experts, to the professionals. I take them to church, and they'll do that for me. I get how it makes sense in our culture, the way we do things. But you know where it doesn't make sense? In God's mind, in God's heart. It's not how God set it up. Deuteronomy chapter 6. Watch this. He's writing to the whole community, everybody. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. Jesus said that, right? When he said it, you may not have known it, but he was quoting Deuteronomy. These commandments that I give to you are to be on your hearts, everybody's hearts. And then watch what he says next. Impress them on your children. What am I supposed to impress? Well, the commandments to love God, love others. To follow God with our life, impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. In other words, when you do the normal things of life, when you drive to school, when you drive to activities, when you are going to bed at night, when you eat meals together, whatever it is you do in your life, talk about those things. See, God has invested the family with a powerful influence. Well, why? Well, lots of reasons, but, but let me just try to give you a, a visual. Uh, this is from a ministry called Orange, and each square represents one year in a kid's life. Now, it gets a little messy here depending on how old the kid is, and each family is a little bit different. But each square represents a, kid, a year in a kid's life, and each dot represents an hour. So they said if you took a kid who came to 40 Sundays out of the year, take out sick days and travel days, things like that, they made 40 out of the 52 Sundays, and they were there for an hour, then in this kid's one year of their life, they'd get 40 hours at church. And that same kid, they estimated, would get 3,000 hours with their family. So if you're going to talk about your faith like Deuteronomy does, if you're going to bring up kids with the idea that, that when you walk and when you go to bed and when you live your life, well, the 3,000 hours are going to have more weight than the 40 hours. So you've heard that since the virus has caused school to shut down, people have been joking that we're all homeschoolers now, right? Whether you wanted to be or not, you're a homeschooler now. But in God's plan, we were always supposed to be homeschoolers when it comes to our faith in Christ. There was a teacher that posted something on social media. My wife showed it to me right as schools were getting ready to close down and uh, uh, kids were getting be educated at home. And one teacher posted something to the effect of some parents are getting ready to find out that the teacher wasn't the problem. <laughs> and I don't know why, but it just cracked me up thinking of teachers relishing that parents are going to have to deal with perfect little Johnny and Susie and realize it wasn't always the teacher's fault because the teacher's got a pretty tough job. Turns out Johnny and Susie aren't the angels their parents thought they were. There is a, a note from a kid named Ben. His mom was doing her best to try to educate him at home, uh, you know, through the school system and what they expected of her. And, and he wrote this note in his journal. Now you can see it just happened March 16th, and he's being homed school. <laughs> he says, Ben writes, it is not going good my mom's getting stressed out. My mom is really getting confused. We took a break so my mom can figure this stuff out. And I'm telling you, it is not going good. Ben's mom had a great attitude about it. She laughed and said, Ben is right. And she posted it on her own social media account. But I bet you that's how we all feel, whether it's educating our kids in the school system right now or whether it's just educating them in our faith. We feel like, you know what, I'm probably in over my head. I don't know the answers to all their questions. I've got my own struggles that I'm dealing with. 
I don't have it all together. But remember the, the powerful influence, the powerful influence God has invested within you is not in having it all together. It's not in being a perfect parent. Here's what it's invested in. It's, 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 it's an engaged relationship. That's where that powerful influence is unleashed and an engaged relationship with your kid. It's a relationship. It's not a class. It's not download of content. But it's engaged. It's not just being with in the same room or the same house. It, it, it's a relationship that engages about faith, about faith in Jesus. Like Deuteronomy 6 said, wherever you go, when you get up, when you lie down, when you do life, and what a time in this virus to, to have an opportunity to talk about Jesus, to talk about the needs that people are having and praying for people and feeling sad sometimes for people that you hear stories about, uh, wrestling with questions about life and death and how to follow Jesus in the middle of a difficult, stressful time. What a fantastic opportunity for parents to invest in their kids, to have that engaged relationship. Now, some of you need to hear me say this. This is not a call to be a perfect parent, to get more organized, to make a new list, to get them signed up for new activities. Uh-uh, that's not what engaged relationship means. It's not what it means. It's not more activities, right? It's talking about Jesus and the normal things of life. Because see, here's the deal. A lot of good parents, good Christian parents who bring their kids here on Sundays, we, 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 don't always talk about Jesus on Monday through Saturday. Yeah, we don't always talk about Jesus. So it's making Jesus a normal part of daily life. And there's a guy named Christian Smith. He's a sociologist, really sharp. And he's been at Duke, Notre Dame, different places. And he followed a group of kids in what's called a longitudinal study all the way from like middle school through high school, college, into young adulthood. And he said he found some key factors that made a difference about whether a kid kept their faith through all those transitions in life. And he said it comes down to really three things. First, far and away first, parental faith engagement, which is exactly what you would expect from Deuteronomy 6. Other adults uh, engaging with kids about faith is number two. And then third, that the kids would develop spiritual habits before they left home. Things like reading their Bible or praying or serving, stuff like that. Now, now what's interesting here is that this confirms what the Bible teaches us, that we need parents to be the primary, uh, take the primary responsibility to pass the baton of faith. But it also shows us what the Bible teaches us, and that parents can't do it alone. We need other adults. We need the larger faith community. So there's a guy named Keith Anderson. He's served, uh, the 20 years that Crossing's been in existence, he's served at least 15 of them, maybe more, in fifth grade. Keith has his own family, does his own thing, right? But he invests in fifth graders for years and years and years. All four of my kids remember Keith Anderson's influence in their life. That was another adult engaging with them about faith. This is a picture of my daughter. She was in middle school then, and this is her friend Beth, who's a part of the crossing. Beth, at this time, is not married. Uh, you know, she, she doesn't have kids, but here she is investing in my daughter. And I think that the reason that my daughter is following Christ, humanly speaking, owes a lot to Beth's investment in her. And, and here's a picture of uh, Jared, who's over there on your left. Here's my son Luke and a couple of his buddies. These guys all go to the crossing. They're all uh, getting ready to graduate from high school. And this is a picture taken back before their freshman year. They're at Six Flags, and Jared is just having fun with them, investing in them around their faith. See, parents, parents have the primary responsibility, but parents can't do it alone. We need other people, other adults adults to be investing in our kids too. And so that's why it's not just a message to parents. It's a message to a whole church. Me not just to invest in my kids, but me to invest in yours and the same. You not just to invest in yours, but also in mine. And we help each other. Let's get practical for a second. Really, really practical. The thing your kids need most from you is not groceries. It's not a well-stocked refrigerator or pantry. It's not to sign them up for more activities or drive them around. What your kids need most from you is for you to walk with God. For you to walk. That's the best Christmas gift, birthday gift you could give your, your kids. is for you to walk with God so that you can engage with them about faith. 
for you to sign up for a, a book discussion or a Bible study, to come to church, to pray, to open your Bible, so that you have something to talk with them about. Then help your kids prioritize. You know, kids are young, they're developing, they don't always have the sense of right priorities. Make sure that they're putting the main thing as the main thing, right? They're not saying no to the best thing just to pursue some good things. Help them with that. And then this is awkward to talk about at the time of the virus, but I'm going to do it anyway. I don't care if it's awkward. Is that the live stream is a great gift for all of us, especially at this time, but really any time. It's great to use uh, when we need it. But what I'm afraid of is that when we use the live stream, the people who suffer the most are the kids. Whether they're young kids or elementary kids or high school kids, it, they're the ones that suffer the most because they don't get material in their language in the way they understand it from people that are going to invest in them. So if you're a parent who's maybe gotten comfortable watching the live stream, even in the good times, understand that that has a cost in your kid's life. Look, this is not a, a, an opportunity to, to get more organized and more committed. It's an opportunity to have an engaged relationship and to seek out other adults who can have that with our own children. I think that when we are allowed to come back together and all meet physically in person, God is going to bring us back stronger because he's working through families. He's working through small groups. He's working through all of us. And one of the things that I'm learning in all this is that my life is messy. That I'm the one who, if you ask my kids, they would say I've often emphasized the wrong things, gotten excited about the wrong things, gotten upset about the wrong things. What, what parenting is to me is that kid who's vomiting while everything's trying to look nice in the picture, but it's not. Nobody's got the perfect family. Nobody's got the perfect life. And so parenting, just like all of life, drives you back to the need for Christ the need for Jesus. It drives us back to this table where we experience the grace of God in the gospel. Jesus, the night before he was crucified, took a loaf of bread and he broke it. And he said, this is my body, take and eat. He took some wine and he poured it into a cup and said, this is my blood, poured out for the forgiveness of sin. In just a moment, I am going to serve you communion. And you'll just take a piece of the bread and dip it into the wine or juice that you have at home. And uh, you don't need to say anything. We'll sing another song to continue to worship. Uh, but here we go. Uh, take a piece of the bread, the body and blood of Christ given for you. Dip it into your wine or juice. Eat in faith. Will you pray with me? Father, we thank you for the grace that sustains us as we walk down the road you have given us in life. We thank you that you always go with us and that you promise that at the end of this life, at the end of that road, is a great feast, a great celebration, that one day we will feast with you in your presence. One day we will share in this table again. God, we long for that day. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.